Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is DVP World. You're watching World News Tonight. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. Our main story today is Ukraine's Independence Day, an important and symbolic day for the nation, which has been heroically defending itself against a full-scale Russian invasion for nearly three years. Polish President Andrzej Duda visited Kyiv today. But first, let's take a look at tonight's headlines. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. suspends his campaign and endorses Donald Trump. Is a ceasefire in Gaza possible? Negotiations continue. 35 years ago, Tadeusz Mazowiecki was appointed as Poland's first non-communist prime minister. Today, Ukraine celebrates its Independence Day, now a symbolic day for the free world. For the past 913 days, Ukrainians have heroically defended themselves against the brutal aggression of Vladimir Putin, showing the world the true meaning of courage and democracy. The Russian president believed that he would capture Kyiv in three days, but underestimated the determination of a free nation. Today, it is the Ukrainians who are striking back, delivering further blows to Vladimir Putin's imperial version of Russia. Ukrainians are celebrating the 33rd anniversary of their declaration of independence. The holiday was marked without mass events, called off for fear of major Russian strikes. Fortunately, no such attacks on major Ukrainian cities took place today. Ukraine will always maintain its independence, and this will never be in question. We have all given an answer together, and it is a historic answer, thanks to our unity, our courage, our joint work. Last night, a Ukrainian drone struck an ammunition depot near the Russian town of Ostrogosk in the Voronezh region. Today, the first and successful combat use of our new weapon, a completely new class of weapon, the Ukrainian Palanitsia drone missile, took place. This is our new method of retaliation against the aggressor. The enemy has been defeated. I thank everyone who made this possible, all the developers, manufacturers and our soldiers. The aircraft, which resembles a cruise missile with larger wings and wheels, has a reported range of about 1,500 kilometers. Its name, Palyanitsia, is a shibboleth, a word notoriously difficult to pronounce correctly for non-native speakers of Ukrainian. It was used to distinguish Russian soldiers from Ukrainian troops in the early days of the invasion. The new drone is an important update of the previous propeller-driven model called Bobber. Its slower speed made it easier to intercept and gave ample warning time. When strikes at air bases were attempted, the Russians were often able to move aircraft elsewhere before the drone struck. The jet-powered Palyanitsia will reach its targets faster, allowing for the Russian air assets to be destroyed on the ground. This, along with the newly provided F-16 jets, might shift the dominance to the Ukrainian side. Ukraine and Russia conducted another prisoner exchange today, releasing 115 POWs each. Some of the Ukrainian soldiers were captured in the early days of the war in Hostomel and Mariupol. After more than two years in captivity, they reached home in time to celebrate their Independence Day. The Polish president arrived in Kyiv today. Andrzej Duda assured that Poland will not abandon Ukraine. More on this visit in a report by our correspondent in Kyiv, Askarji. Polish President Andrzej Duda made a surprise and unexpected visit to Ukraine today, to the capital of Kyiv, to help mark Ukraine's 33rd Independence Day. That's the third Independence Day since the full-scale war with Russia began in February 22. Uh, Duda visited uh, Zelensky and he paid his respects at the Wall of Remembrance uh, for fallen Ukrainian soldiers. And his trip uh, really symbolizes the growing relationship that Poland and Ukraine have had, especially since the war began. Poland is now considered one of Ukraine's uh, closest uh, geopolitical partners, uh, important for military aid, for training its soldiers, uh, and for the diplomatic support and financial support that Warsaw has provided to Kyiv since the war began. Now, Duda spoke at a press conference earlier today. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Being in Kiev on the 33rd anniversary of Ukraine's independence, I consider it an exceptional honor. Without an independent Ukraine, it is hard to imagine an independent and secure Poland, Lithuania or other countries in our region. 
Ukrainian Independence Day has become a poignant celebration for the Ukrainian people. Uh, a recent study by the Kiev Institute of Sociology uh, said that Ukrainian Independence Day is now considered the third most important uh, public holiday in Ukraine, just behind uh, Christmas and Easter. It wasn't always like this. In fact, if you go back to before the war began with Russia in 2014 to 2013, before the Revolution of Dignity, uh, Ukrainian Independence Day was seen as one of the least important uh, holidays for the Ukrainian people. So it just goes to show how much politics has changed uh, the mind of people and influenced their thinking on things not just like independence but of Independence Day itself. And I'm sure the people of Ukraine will be looking forward to celebrating many more Ukrainian Independence Days in the future. It's Oz Katerji reporting from Kyiv for TVP World. Robert Francis Kennedy Jr. has dropped out of the U.S. presidential race. While originally hailing from the Democratic Party, he decided to endorse his political opponent, Republican candidate Donald Trump. Scenes like these are few and far between, but when they happen, they tend to make a major impact. The question is, will RFK Jr.'s decision to abandon his White House bid affect the presidential race as much as some are hoping it will? Three great causes drove me to enter this race in the first place, primarily. And these are the principal causes that persuaded me to leave the Democratic, Democratic Party and, and run as an independent. And now to throw my support to President Trump. The, the causes were free speech, the war in Ukraine, and the war on our children. Polls showing data a day before RFK Jr.'s resignation show Kamala Harris with a 3.7% lead over Donald Trump. Kennedy Jr., who up until now was in third place, now has around 4.6% of voters to give away. But who stands to gain from RFK Jr.'s decision to drop out? Scott Lucas of University College Dublin thinks the Democrats might not get a large split of the pot. I think the Harris campaign may get a little bit of a bump by pointing out the fact that Robert Kennedy is, and I just have to use this word, uh, is a head case. Uh, he is, he's not a person who's a rational politician Despite the very famous family name, uh, this is a man who has claimed that he makes eccentric statements because his brain was eaten by worms more than a decade ago. Kennedy Jr.'s supporters in Phoenix, Arizona, proved this theory, saying they're on board with their former candidate's decision. I think that right now it was the right decision for Kennedy from a pragmatic standpoint uh, is that, you know, he, he can join forces with Trump, fight against the Democrats who are clearly corrupt, and then he can actually get in there and have a seat at the table and actually tackle some of these important issues. While many suggest Donald Trump might come out on top in November with RFK Jr.'s support, the polls show that the race will still be extremely close. Once again, the fate of the United States will most likely be in the hands of undecided voters living in the swing states. Despite earlier concerns of a collapse, Israeli-Palestinian ceasefire talks continue on Sunday. A Hamas delegation has arrived in Cairo to hear the results from U.S., Egyptian and Qatari mediators, a move that could prevent an all-out war in the Middle East and halt the downward spiral of a humanitarian crisis of enormous proportions. Violence continues in the Gaza Strip. At least 12 Palestinians, including two children and a woman, were killed in Israel attacks on Saturday morning. But contrary to initial media reports earlier in the week, the long-sought ceasefire for hostages deal may still be salvageable. A Hamas delegation headed by its political bureau deputy chairman Khalil al hayya arrived in Cairo on Saturday. However, another senior Hamas official said the delegation's arrival did not mean that Hamas would participate in the next round of talks. Hamas is on its way to Cairo to learn about the mechanisms that have been worked out to finalize the ceasefire for hostages deal. We must agree on the mechanisms to implement this July 2nd proposal. Constant renegotiation is not an option. Netanyahu continues to prevaricate in his reactions to the proposal prioritizing the Philadelphia access over the release of the hostages. The Philadelphia Corridor is a narrow 14km strip of land situated along the entire border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt. Hamas has demanded a complete withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza, but Netanyahu has ruled out such an option. The war has resulted in a horrific deterioration of living conditions in Gaza. There is now a confirmed polio outbreak in Gaza. 
the first confirmed case, a 10-month-old baby in Derivella, is an individual tragedy, and at the same time, a sign of a larger looming catastrophe. Polio is a highly infectious virus and can infect anyone at any age. Poland's Prime Minister Donald Tusk has also spoken out on the need for truce and the dire situation in Gaza. We cannot allow ourselves to be manipulated into the biased narrative of one side or the other. Hamas attacked innocent people. We are also extremely disheartened by the events in Gaza, the constant bombings. We see that these are not the basis of terrorists, but places where the victims are mainly civilians, including adults and children. This is unacceptable. A total of 1,200 people were killed and 250 abducted by Hamas following its incursion into Israel on October 7th last year. According to Palestinian health authorities, over 40,000 people have been killed in Gaza as a result of Israel's retaliation. Three people are dead and at least four wounded following a stabbing attack in the German city of Solingen. The suspect is still at large. German police is searching for the attacker responsible for stabbing seven people on Friday night. A 15-year-old boy has been arrested in connection with the attack. He is suspected of knowing about the preparations for the attack, but not of carrying it out. At 9.37 p.m. we received several calls informing us that an unknown perpetrator had attacked several people with a knife apparently at random here at the festival in Solingen. Unfortunately, we are mourning the loss of three lives. Three people have died. In addition, at least four others have been seriously injured. The attack took place at the Festival of Diversity, marking the 650th anniversary of the establishment of the city. Local officials are pointing to terrorism as a possible motive for the attack. We have not yet been able to determine a motive. However, based on the overall circumstances, we assume that the initial suspicion of a terrorist-motivated offense cannot be ruled out. The attack comes less than three months after another mass stabbing in Germany. In late May, an Afghan refugee stormed an event organized by a critic of Islam, killing a police officer and wounding six more people. Italian prosecutors have launched a manslaughter investigation into the sinking of the Basian, a family super yacht owned by British tech magnate Mike Lynch. Seven people died in an incident. The body of the last missing victim of the accident off the coast of Sicily has been found. She is believed to be the daughter of Mike Lynch. Italian prosecutors have launched an investigation into the incident. La Procura della Repubblica di Termini Merese. The Public Persecutor's Office of Termini Imeresa has registered a file with the state against unknown persons, hypothesizing the crimes of culpable shipwreck and multiple culpable homicide. The investigation is not yet targeting any particular individual. Fifteen people survived the sinking, including Lynch's wife and the yacht's captain. We pray to the Lord and we ask for a blessing for those who died, and we pray to the Lord to help those saved, even though they will surely suffer. The more than 50-meter-long Bayesian luxury boat was anchored off Palermo in the western part of Sicily. It capsized and rapidly sank after being struck by a storm. The investigation could be hampered by the fact that the shipwreck lies at a depth of 50 meters, it could be pulled out, but the operation would be costly. While well, August 24th might be just another day for most of the world, it holds deep significance for many Poles. It marks 35 years since Tadeusz Mazowiecki was chosen as Poland's first non-communist prime minister, a pivotal moment in the country's history. <laughs> After decades of enduring heavy-handed communist rule, Poles across the country became fed up with food shortages and increasingly strict policies of the Communist Party. <laughs> this, alongside labor turmoil, led to the creation of Solidarity in September 1980, an independent trade union which quickly transformed itself into an anti-communist social movement. 
Their work and sacrifice eventually led to the communists agreeing to hold partially independent parliamentary elections in June of 1989, which saw solidarity topple the established government. This left the incumbent communist president, Wojciech Jaruzelski, with no other option but to name a member of Solidarity as the country's first non-communist prime minister. That man was Tadeusz Mazowiecki, appointed as Prime Minister of Poland on August 24, 1989, and that date is remembered by both his colleagues and future generations as a major turning point in Central and Eastern European politics. The most important date, as a matter of fact, for the last decades of our country, but also from Europe point of view, because, you see, we started uh, to fight against communism in 1980. I was member of the Solidarity Trade Union since the very beginning, and uh, I had the great honor to lead a first big Congress of Solidarity in 1981. Now, 35 years later, Mazowiecki's rule continues to influence the Polish political landscape, serving as a reminder of the power of peaceful negotiation and the resilience of democratic values in the face of oppression. Campus, the future of Poland 2024 is a youth conference in northeastern Poland where over 1,500 young people have gathered to discuss pressing social and political issues facing the country. The seven-day event began on Friday with opening speeches by Prime Minister Donald Tusk and Warsaw Mayor Rafał Trzewskowski. Our reporter Sasha Fabak was there. Speaking to thousands of young people here in Olsztyn, Prime Minister Donald Tusk yesterday inaugurated this event next to Rafał Czewskowski, who is still currently the mayor of Warsaw. And today we had a chat with the mayor and asked him very much about his presidential ambitions, if he did, will be that new candidate for the ruling coalition. He said it's too early to tell, and we asked him also what that means for his future, and also very much about what role Europe plays for Poland. So let's listen to the words of the mayor now. It's absolutely crucial because, uh, of course, we cannot uh, deal with uh, any of the priorities on our own. Uh, what's changed is, is, is that now leadership is here. Donald Tusk is one of the most important leaders in the European Union and he sets the tone. So in those words, is also very much about how important that role is for Poland and Europe moving forward together. And also I pressed him on what that means for Germany as well. He was critical here of a lack of German leadership, what that means for Poland. So let's listen to his words in this next segment. There is no leadership coming from Germany at this particular point in time. Uh, we are taking responsibility for Europe's security, Europe security more than some of our partners uh, when it comes to the defense spending in relation to our GDP, we're spending much more than, than Germany. So yes, uh, uh, we are feeling uh, the, the vacuum when it comes to leadership in Europe. So with all that combined, here is a man who has not officially said he's going to be the candidate, but with Donald Tusk ruling himself out just some days ago, and with very much a youthful audience here around us, it's a very clear message that uh, Mr. Tuskovsky might well make another bid as president. We'll see that in the coming weeks and months. That's Sasha Farbach for TVP World in Austin. Polish cities are also celebrating the 33rd anniversary of Ukraine's independence. In Warsaw, the main festivities are taking place on the Castle Square. Our reporter Marek Steele is there to tell us how the Poles and refugees from Ukraine are celebrating this important day. Well, you can see probably behind me there's a concert currently taking place. You can probably hear it too. At least several thousand people gathered here today in Warsaw at the Castle Square to celebrate Ukraine's uh, independence. What the organizers say is uh, the largest such event in the world, not only because uh, U Ukraine doesn't organize such events because of uh, the threat of shelling, but also because Poland has such a huge Ukrainian diaspora living here. Uh, let's take a listen now to what some of the people gathered here told me about their emotions, about them uh, and uh, Ukraine's Independence Day. Every anniversary is different. It's different every year and every year it hurts more. Today, whether you are female or male, whether you live at home or abroad, it is hard to hold back the tears. We are proud of our country and our people. 
This day is very important to me. My son will be presented with other heroes who sacrificed their lives for our independence. One of the main goals of this event was also uh, to honor the victims of the war, so those who were killed in the Ukraine war. I saw many cards here being put up with names of uh, their relatives, the relatives of Ukrainians gathered here, who were killed in this war in Ukraine. But there was also one goal of this event, I think the primary one, uh, to uphold a sense of unity among Ukrainians who are spread across the world and across Poland. Uh, this is what one of the organizers of the event told me. Let's take a listen. We should use this moment to deliver the message that is right now very prominent for us, that is very um, actual for us. This is first of all the integration into European Union, also joining NATO and also giving Ukraine more, uh, more armor and more weapons that it deserves. The Ukrainian national anthem was sung here today along the Polish national anthem. So this is definitely also an event that unites both Ukrainians and Poles. Back to you, Ben. Thank you so much for the update. And we will be continuing this topic in our talk coming up next. The Polish president, Andrzej Duda's visit to Kyiv on Ukraine's 33rd Independence Day underscore the unwavering support Poland offers in the face of Russian aggression. As President Zelensky delivered a stirring speech promising Ukrainian-style retaliation, Duda's president highlighted the deepening ties between Poland and Ukraine. Joining us today to discuss the significance of Duda's visit and Zelensky's bold message to Russia is Bogdan Hello, editor-in-chief of Key Post. Hello, sir, and a welcome to TVP World. Good evening, everybody. So, can you tell us what message does Duda's visit send to both Ukraine and the international community? Look, it's very important that he, as a neighbor and as a, a key ally, was here together with the Lithuanian uh, president. Uh, it has immense symbolic value. Look, we didn't have an easy history in the past for hundreds of, of years, but the last decades, Poland has been shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine. And today, that was again uh, emphasized by uh, Duda's presence in Kyiv. Uh, on a day when many feared that the Russians would strike hard with missiles and with drones, uh, there was a, an air of apprehension. Uh, you know, the Russians have been very quiet for two or three days, suspiciously. Um, the nightly attacks aimed at Kyiv ha have not occurred. We're expecting the worst tonight or tomorrow. And uh, all, you know, all kudos to President Duda for um, taking that risk and being with us on this very special day today. Right, very suspicious indeed. And uh, how do you interpret Zelensky's promise of a Ukrainian-style retaliation against Russia? What does that mean? All he means is not retaliation, not blood, not killing Russian citizens. And what he means is you're going to suffer what we've suffered for the last two and a half years, in effect, 10 years. Um, unfortunately, your villages and towns we will have to storm and take because we need that uh, collateral and that, uh, uh, that property f to trade in later and also to put pressure onto Putin. So that's what he means. He means that you're going to actually um, taste what we've been tasting for at least 10 years and for two and a half years very intensively. Right, like you mentioned, uh, there was land being taken by, from the Ukrainian side that might be used as a leverage in the upcoming peace talk. Do you think that's the primary reason for this incursion into Kursk, or are there any kind of military front when it comes to its calculation? Look, I think it's clear to everybody. The Ukrainians have gone in basically f uh, for tactical reasons to... Um, make uh, the Russians deploy some of their forces that are attacking very heavily in uh, uh, the D uh, Donetsk region so that um, it weakens their attacks there. Secondly, by taking uh, Russian territory temporarily, Russia's not, Ukraine's not out to grab Russian lands. What interest does it have in having the Kursk region, which incidentally has a lot of Ukrainian speakers, the older generation. Um, it's really to say, look, if you're gonna, if you're gonna gra uh, grab and hold on to our land, uh, we're gonna take some of your land. And uh, uh, if you want to uh, trade, uh, eventually, let's do so, because uh, you're not going to get away with it. 
And uh, thirdly, I think very importantly, is the psycholog psychological factor that Ukraine, by striking into Russia, wants the Russian population to feel that they are not invincible, they are not almighty, that the naked emperor hasn't provided the, uh, the swift victories, you know, taking Ukraine and uh, Kiev in three days, and now even not even being taking uh, the uh, Donetsk region, as he had insisted in many times, he'd set deadlines. They haven't even taken that. So uh, I think this exposure uh, to the Russians, that they themselves are at risk, their energy infrastructure, oil infrastructure, gas infrastructure have been hard hit and will be even harder hit by uh, long range Ukrainian missiles and by the aircraft that are coming into play. So um, questions are being asked. And I'm sure that there is a lot of unease within the inner circles in, in Moscow, in the Kremlin. And that's exactly what Ukraine wants. Right. And, and the naked emperor is a pretty apt uh, metaphor for what Putin is right now. We're looking at the situation where uh, Zelensky has made a reference to Putin as the sick old man from Red Square. What do you make of that? It's exactly that. I mean, uh, Putin is a very complex figure, uh, not only because of his uh, diminutive stature, uh, you know, look at Hitler, look at Napoleon, all of these people that somehow had complexes, not only about their size, but about their uh, belonging in the scheme of things. We, we have these pictures of Putin carrying the bags and uh, the uh, suitcases for former Russian leaders in the early 90s. He was a nobody. He was a former, you know, security official that suddenly uh, broke through the ranks uh, uh, through corrupt circles and then wanted to be Tarzan, wanted to, you know, flex his muscles, remember his early photos, naked on a horse and all of this, macho figure. Uh, you know, the world doesn't buy into that, maybe initially, but now he's regarded as a rather pathetic person, wavering, waving his nuclear weapons around, constantly talking about red lines and not, not adhering to the threats I don't mean that he should in terms of nuclear weapons, but at least taking much more significant military uh, responses to uh, Ukrainian um, uh, incursions, but also the weapons that have been coming and are flowing more freely now from the West. And with that being said, do you think at this point we're going to see uh, Zelensky taking a shift in Ukraine's strategy towards Russia going forward? Do you see, how do you see the conflict evolving in the very near future? Look, let's not, get, let's not get carried away and let's not run forward too, too far. Uh, Zelensky has a very difficult situation. The situation in the Donetsk region is by no means a happy one for the Ukrainians. They're under great pressure and they've been losing territory while gaining territory further north in the Kursk region in Russia itself. Uh, and they've made a slight uh, new uh, mini offensive in the Kharkiv region where they've taken a little bit of territory, the Ukrainians, I mean. So look, at the moment, it's, it's uh, with all the attention being on the Kursk region, it's still a very delicately balanced uh, setup. And I wouldn't rush to any conclusions. Clearly, the Russians were caught by surprise, off guard. They are struggling to get the additional 50,000, 100,000 uh, crack troops, not raw recruits, not Chechens that are supposed to guard the area but run away on the first day, to uh, protect uh, at least uh, from the bridgehead that the Ukrainians uh, have established. Uh, it's difficult for both sides, but I think uh, what has happened is that in as we talk, I'm in Kiev, that's a signal coming now that there's an air attack, an air alert, just for viewers to watch. That happens every so often. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the situation is very delicate. Much will depend not only on the resolve of the Ukrainians, but at what pace and in what volume will the weapons and support keep flowing in from the West? Will the West lift this embargo on striking deeper into Russia with Western-made weapons. That's crucial right now. Ukraine could do the job. It could force the public in Russia to say, hey, what's going on? We were promised a quick victory. We were promised a great Russia. And what do we have? The humiliation of having Ukrainian troops on our territory. For the first time, foreign troops since the Germans and the Nazis invaded in the 40, early 40s. 
All right. So, uh, sorry, I just have to mention that the uh, air raid alarm just during our interview is a very good indicator of a situation and how hard it is over there. So thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us under these circumstances. Really appreciate it. Our guest has been Bonnie Hello, editor-in-chief of The Key Post. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And with that, we conclude this edition of our interview as well as this edition of World News. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TV World.